While the situation in Lebanon is truly horrible and tragic, with every day bringing more and more deaths, um, I'm not even sure how many we've had today, to be honest. I, I looked yesterday, I've looked this morning, it seems to spiral out of control at this point to the, to the to a level where you'd have to be looking every 20 minutes or something, I think, sometimes. But there is one thing that's I've noticed that most of the news um, read accounts are not touching on, possibly because it's controversial or raise the temperature even further, but it's this. I'm going to read a kind of Potter's summary I did of the event, and I'll give some links so people can read around it and form their own opinions. But this is... I. Ch- I don't generally do scripts. I talk off the my, um, off the cuff, but with this particular one, I felt it might be useful to do a very short script. The Sabra and Shatila massacre took place from September 16th to 18th, 1982, during the Lebanese Civil War. It occurred in the Sabra neighbourhood and the adjacent Shatila refugee camp in Beirut in Lebanon. The massacre resulted in the deaths of between 1,300 and 3,500 civilians, primarily Palestinians and Lebanese Sears. There is a great deal of debate about how many people died in this for with each side presenting their own figures. It's become like an event like something like the Amritsar massacre where each side has its own point of view and has its own agenda in presenting the number of victims killed. Background, in 19, June 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon with the aim of eliminating the PLO, which had been launching attacks on Israel from southern Lebanon. By the end of August 1982, the PLO had withdrawn from Beirut under the supervision of a multinational force, leaving behind a vulnerable population of Palestinian refugees and Lebanese civilians. There is actually an involvement of Irish Defence Forces where they became rather heated and grumpy with the Israelis and the Israelis with them, but it's a side issue compared to the death of thousands. But because it illustrates some of the tensions between the multinational force that was there, and how they found the Israelis were not really help being cooperative. I may do another presentation on it at some point. The massacre on September the 15th, 1982, following the assassination of Lebanese President-elect Bachir Gamel, Israeli forces surrounded the Sabra and Shatila camps. The next day, the Israeli military allowed the Lebanese Christian militia, known as the Falange, to enter the camps. Over the next 43 hours, the militia carried out a brutal massacre, killing thousands of civilians. The Israeli forces stationed around the camps provided logistical support and flares to illuminate the area at night. Now, as I say, given the current tensions, um, I've noticed the BBC and most other newscasters have avoided mentioning that the invasion of the Shatila camp occurred roughly at the same time in the year as the current situation in Lebanon. Aftermath and reactions, the massacre sparked international outrage and condemnation. An independent, an independent commission led by Irish diplomat Sean McBride concluded that the Israeli Defence Forces, IDF, as the occupying power bore responsibility for the massacre. The United Nations General Assembly condemned the massacre as an act of genocide. The Sabra and Shatila massacre remains one of the most harrowing events of the Lebanese Civil War, highlighting the devastating att- impact of the conflict on civilians and the complex interplay of local and international forces in the region. Before I go on, um, Sean McBride, of course, is a major figure in Irish and other countries' history and was the son of one of the elite, uh, leaders of the Easter Rising, although in John McBride's case, he only became involved after it was planned because he was such a drunk that they didn't really want to get him involved. But still, he fought for and died. It's just an interesting sideline of interesting history and sex. I've got some other news articles from several places. We'll have a quick look at them. We're not going to have a look at mushy peas. That's just up there because I, I was doing a recipe earlier. We've got Britannica, which gives a very large amount of background detail if you want to read it. That'll go into extreme detail. Um, that's Britannica's strong point. Of course, it has its own biases like anything else, but it does try at least to be present numerous sources and to try and give you a, a good backdrop. You've also got um, uh, uh, this article from the Jewish Chronicle, or the Jewish Professional Library, and that's an example of two to start with. I'll put them both up there because although this is short, it gives a slightly different backdrop and a slightly different angle. 
Now I've noticed that little attention has been paid, as I say, to rem- like drawing up the drawing parallels with this, or pointing out the Sabra and Chatilla massacre, and you have to rem- to be approaching sixty really to remember the Chatilla massacre in detail. I was a ten, and ten year olds are not really tend to be interested in that sort of stuff. At that age, I was more interested in I don't know reading a comic book or or just about getting into computer games. My understanding of the politics behind this would be minimal and I wouldn't be equipped to as a 10-year-old. But I think it's important that some focus is given to it and its role in Lebanese and Israeli history for an understanding of the background is what is going on there right now.